With Star Trek, you can, because there were so many nuances that were going on in the characterizations and the dialogue. The themes were so strong, but you enjoyed being among those characters. And uh, and it still holds up for me to this day. I don't watch it constantly. I, I won't watch it for several years. And then I'll just get the DVD set out, and I'll start watching them in chronological order and have a great time. Oh, yeah. What's your favorite of all the Star Treks? I, my personal favorite is Shore Leave, written by Theodore Sturgeon, who was a science fiction novelist. And, uh, and another one is This Side of Paradise that my friend Dorothy Fontana wrote. Uh, she did the foreword for my new book, and I think she wrote some of the best episodes. She did another great one called Journey to Babel. And if you don't know the titles, uh, shore leave uh, is exactly what you would expect. They're on a planet where they're taking shore leave, but they keep seeing things, whatever they're thinking of. They see, and some of those things turn out to be deadly. And it just had so many fantastic moments in it. It was so imaginative, so interesting, so nicely done. And uh, this side of paradise is the one where Spock gets shot by spores, and for the first time in his life, he's able to fall in love with Jill Ireland. And that poignant line at the end of the show, after Kirk breaks the spell and gets him back, and uh, Spock says, you know, for the first time in my life, I was happy. And, oh, my God. <laughs> and, and Journey to Babel was the one where we met Sarek, uh, Spock's father, who I borrowed for an episode that uh, I pitched to Gene Roddenberry for Star Trek Next Generation called Sarek. Uh, so, you know, there are just so many. It's hard to pick your favorite from that series, but those are three that definitely uh, connected with me the first time I saw them, and I can watch them for the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth time now after all these years and still have such a great time. Oh, yeah. I just wonder if Shatner would ever come back on any of the series to, you know, as a walk by or a walk in or whatever you want to call it. He said he's willing, uh, you know, but it would have to be the material would have to be right. Leonard would felt the same way. Leonard Nimoy, he, he felt that uh, if the script is good, uh, if the part is, is right, if it feels right, he'll do it. And Shatner has said that, too. You know, so they would have to come up with a story that uh, we we did one on Star Trek Continues, and Vic can tell you about this um, that uh, Judy Burns wrote. I brought her in because when I interviewed her for my books, she wrote the Tholian Web for the original series, and she told me when I was interviewing her that she had actually had a sequel that she wanted to do, and if there had been a fourth season, they were going to do it. And so she told me the story. I thought it was great. I brought it to Vic, and they ended up doing it as a Star Trek uh, continues episode where Kirk is still on the Defiant. Uh, and and uh, they ran into this ghost ship, the Defiant, and Kirk beamed over with the crew, but he couldn't get off. And later in the episode, they get him off. But, but uh, Judy's idea was what if he was still on the ship? The real Kirk came back, but he left an impression of himself that's still on the ship. And that Kirk believes he's been abandoned. And he's been on this ship for years now and has thought that his crew left him out there. And uh, it's, it's really a fascinating tale, and, and your listeners can watch it by going to StarTrekContinues.com. And I can't think of the name of the episode, Vic could tell us, uh, but I shepherded that one in. And uh, when they were doing that, they thought, what if we could get Shatner to play the Kirk that's still on the Defiant? Because it's in a different time zone, in a sense. And so he could be older. And then Vic playing the, the young Captain Kirk, or Captain Kirk as we remember him from the original series, would then encounter himself as an older man. And uh, we'll have to get Vic to talk about that, because I, I know Vic would, wanted to bring Shatner on, but uh, they ended up not doing it. But Shatner had said he would be willing to do something if it was right. Interesting. Yeah, and hoping he's going to call in. I just was while you were talking too. I was checking my emails and made sure he had my right number. So I, I and hopefully something didn't happen. You take commercial breaks, right? Uh, eight o'clock, and I would love to have him in here before eight. Oh, okay. Well, I can't give you his phone number live on the now. Air. Is there any way? <laughs> any, is there any way you can maybe text him? Pardon me. Can you? Is there any way you can send a text or anything to him? I can't because I'm up in the mountains where I where I'm hiding out and writing this book, and I don't get a uh, signal here. But I'll tell you what: if you fly me an email, you know my email address, don't you? Uh, I don't you fly me an email, and I will send you his 
his information right back to you. Yeah, unfortunately, I have your agent's email. I don't have yours. Oh, my goodness. We're so helpless. I know. <laughs> yeah. Hey, fly her an email. She'll, she'll, call, uh, she'll call Vic. She's a publicist for my publisher. And uh, you've got her email. Just fly her an email and say, get Vic on the phone. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Talk a little bit more about Star Trek. I'm going to send a message real quick while you do that. Yeah. And, and at worst case, at the top of the hour, when you take your break, I'll give you all the information. We'll pull them in at that point. Uh, so Star Trek. Oh, yeah, Star Trek. Um, I wrote the book the books, uh, because uh, when I was young, and one of the first books I read that just really knocked me out about the making of a television show was called The Making of Star Trek. And it primarily dealt with uh, the creation of the show and getting it going. It came out in 1968 while the show was still being made. And when I interviewed Gene Roddenberry for a, a TV special in L.A., I asked him if he had kept all the uh, show files, all the memos and everything for every episode. And he said, yes. And there were like 40 of them, huge boxes filled with thousands and thousands of documents. And, uh, and he invited me to put them all in a book. Well, you can't put all that in a book. So we ended up doing a three book set, one for each season. And the great thing about these books is that you get to read bits from all these emails all put together. Each, each, each uh, episode has a chapter. And so you go through the process of them writing the script, and you hear them talking to each other. Uh, Gene Roddenberry talking to Dorothy Fontana and Gene Kuhn and Bob Justman and Stan Robertson at NBC, and having, having, uh, going back and forth, brainstorming sessions, debates, arguments about each episode and what they want to do, what they can afford to do, what the censors will allow them to do and everything else, then we take you onto the soundstage because we have all the production memos and we know where everything was shot and what happened that day, what went right, what went wrong, the whole thing. And then we have the, uh, the release and the reaction of the episode with the uh, reviews that came out, the ratings for every episode, the whole bit. So you read a chapter and then you go sit down and you pull out those DVDs and you watch that episode and you see it in a whole new light. So that was something I wanted to do. Gene was very supportive. Uh, sadly, I took so long to get the books done, he didn't get to see them come out. But uh, he was he was there contributing, connected me with Bob Justman, Dorothy Fontana, uh, John D.F. Black, uh, who was the associate producer on the first season and came up with the line Space, The Final Frontier. And John wrote the foreword for the first book. And uh, And so we did these things, and it's just allows you to go back in time, get on a time machine, and you're not reading about something that happened back then. You are back then watching it happen all around you. Now, where was it shot? Was it shot in Desi Lu Studios? Yep, right next door to I Spy. And on the other side was Mission Impossible, and across the way was Hogan's Heroes, and and Lucille Ball's driving by on our golf cart. She was running Desi Lu at that time, and she was the one who was the champion of Star Trek. The board of directors tried to talk her out of doing it. They said, this, this show will destroy the studio. It'll be too expensive. And it turned out they were right. Uh, and Paramount ended up taking over halfway through the second season. Uh, but she did it because Desi had taught her that the way to ha- be successful in Hollywood is to own the show, not just make shows for other companies, but to own it. And it was because of Isle of Lucy and the rerun rights, which they had, that they were able to buy RKO and start Desi Lu Studios. And then Desi was gone, so now Lucy wanted to try to carry on in the tradition that he had taught her. And so she was looking for a show that she thought could rerun as long as I Love Lucy could. And uh, they brought her, Herb Solo brought her Gene Roddenberry, and he had this idea called Star Trek. And she said, that could do it. And boy, was she right. Well, didn't she have, though, like Mission Impossible? I would think the production for that would have been very expensive. And it's not fair. Thank you. It's not fair to, as I just did, to blame it on Star Trek that she lost her studio. It was the one-two punch of Star Trek and Mission Impossible. I Spy didn't take them down because I Spy was privately owned by Sheldon Leonard, and he was just using Desilu as a uh, home base to make the show, which they were filming most of it around the, around the planet in different countries. Uh, but, uh, but So that didn't bring Desilu down. But it, the one-two punch of Mission Impossible and Star Trek, mostly Star Trek because it was more expensive than Mission, but those two shows running simultaneously, you're doing deficit financing. 
you know, the network's only giving you so much for each episode to air it, and it doesn't replenish what you spent. So a big studio like Paramount or 20th Century Fox can survive having a show like that, but Desilu wasn't able to. Halfway into the second season, and it was halfway into the uh, uh, the first season for uh, Mission Possible, I believe, uh, they just ran out of cash, and she had to uh, sell to Paramount. Which is a big shame, too, because I think if I remember right, Mission Impossible was a fairly high-rated show also. Yeah. <clears throat> and the first thing uh, first thing Paramount did was slash the budgets to both. <clears throat> so they, they, uh, they took down the budgets. That's why Martin Landau ended up leaving uh, Mission Impossible, because the budgets were cut so much. Uh, the third year of Star Trek uh, wasn't as good as the first or second, although there's some excellent stories in there, like the one we were talking about earlier, Let That Be Your Last Battlefield. Uh, but they didn't have the money they had during the first two seasons, so very few shows can be shot on location. Uh, most of them were bottle shows on the ship or minimal sets and things of that nature. Uh, they just uh, Bob Justman would complain in memos uh, at that time. He would say, you know, we're trying to do half a science fiction movie every week on the budget of a radio show. And it wasn't that bad, but it felt that bad to him because they had been cut so much from the first and the second se- season. Interesting. So it, it, Paramount is now reaping the rewards, but they did everything they could to kill Star Trek. And that's crazy because, you know, I didn't they, after they, they axed it, didn't they want to try to get it, if I was reading right, and I think our conversation about a year later, they tried to get it to come back? That's in the new book. And uh, the, the new book is called uh, These Are the Voyages, Gene Roddenberry and Star Trek in the 1970s, and it came out uh, about a month ago. It's a two two book set. The second one will be out uh, before Christmas. And so the first one covers 1970 through 75, and the second one takes you through the end of the decade. So in the first book, we have the animated series, and the second one, we have the Star Trek, the motion picture, but there's a lot of other stuff that's going on during that time. The, uh, the, the boom in syndication, the boom in merchandising, uh, Paramount dragging their feet on bringing the series back. NBC called them, you remembered right. Uh, NBC called them two years after canceling the show and wanted it back in prime time. And Paramount wouldn't give it to them because they said, we're making too much money in syndication. If we give it back to you, it's going to cause the bottom to drop out on the syndication package, which is absurd. But they believe that. And so NBC kept coming back year after year saying, can we have the show back? Finally, they said, you can have it in a different form. And that ended up being the, the animated show. And then they decided, well, we're going to do it uh, as a movie. And it took them five years to get the movie made. They kept turning scripts down. They rejected a couple scripts Roddenberry had written and kept bringing in different writers. They couldn't find the script that they wanted to make, so they were going to do it as a TV show again. And they had the sets built. The cast was under contract. Everything was ready to go. They were going to start with a two-hour premiere episode called In Thy Image. And they already had uh, the rest of the season written. And we were going to have Star Trek back every week. And within two weeks before they were going to start filming, they pulled the plug on the series and because Star Wars had just come out. And Paramount said, oh, well, now we got to do it as a movie. <laughs> <laughs> let's, take that, let's take that first episode, that two-hour episode, and let's do that as a movie. And that became Star Trek, the motion picture. Very interesting story to, to see everything that it was going through in the 1970s and how it was becoming so popular and how NBC wanted it back, and yet it wasn't coming back. And we were all getting frustrated. Why aren't we getting Star Trek back? And it took an entire decade, really, to get it back. And that's what this book covers. Now, would have Shatner came back if they would have brought the show back? Yeah. Oh, he was under contract. Uh, everybody was, uh, except Nimoy. Uh, Nimoy was willing to do it, uh, but they didn't want him you have to read the book to find out why uh i can tell you uh, there was some blood bad blood at that point between him and roddenberry uh and uh so they said well we'll have you back for a couple episodes and he said no i'm either doing the whole series or i'm not doing it at all so they brought in a young guy who was going to play a junior officer on the bridge and he was going to be a vulcan and he was going to be uh the spock in training and uh, he's in all the scripts that they were going to do, and he was in the first scripts for um, In Thy Image. Uh, and then when they did the movie, they took that character out, and they put Spock back in, and that's how we got Star Trek, the motion picture. Now, Shatner, I think, if I remember right, reading somewhere, he, he kind of got a lot of flack 
for the movie. Uh, didn't he direct one? Yeah, that was the fifth one, though. 